Hi, this is Jennifer from Positively Learning, and today we're going to be talking about my favorite topic, data collection. It's also the topic I'm probably asking about the most, maybe because I talk about it so much, um, but I wanted to share a quick video full of some action steps. Now, if you've been following my channel and you are subscribed, thank you very much. You know that I like to do these unboxing videos where I take a teacher resource, I download it, and we open it up together and walk through it. And then I take some notes on how to use the product from its like intended use to really what happens in the classroom and some differentiation tips. This video is going to be slightly different because instead of a product, I'm going to be talking about this blog post, and I'll be sure to link it below for you. I'm also going to be taking my notes. All right, so it's going to be a quick video because I really just want to provide some quick tips and some action steps, but I'd like you to click on this blog post um, to get more information if this is an area that you're interested in. And in this blog post, there's a option to sign up for a five-day email series. And every email talks about data collection and some quick tips. And the reason I really want you to sign up is there's some freebies in there. You are going to get some data tracking forms. There's a paper, a digital, and then another editable. Um, there's even a link to a free IEP training masterclass. If you haven't taken that yet, I highly recommend it um, going through for some more data collection tips. So one thing that I hear the most, probably the most common question is, what data collection system do you recommend? What can I do? And it's often coming from a place of just I'm collecting tons of data. I don't know if this is very useful. This doesn't seem very organized. Like there has to be a better way. Please help. <laughs> and I can completely understand because I was always coming from a place of collecting more data than I probably needed, but you never know. So I would just collect more and um, it was kind of, it was a lot. It was a lot. And I was always wondering like, is there a better way? And luckily I do have some tips um, that will hopefully make it a little more effective and a little easier to do. But I do have one huge myth to bust right away. And you probably know this, but it's still a little hard to hear. Here's myth. Mythbuster number one, there's no perfect data system, which is sad. <laughs> it would be so nice to have a system that you knew like, oh, I can depend on this. This is reliable. I've got it. But then this is also kind of good news because you could just take that pressure off right now. Don't worry about that. Like there is no perfect system that you're missing. You're not missing anything. There are so many different ways to collect data. And there's great things about all of them, or at least most of them. And there's some that are can be just awesome. They're just not going to meet your needs. So the goal of a data collection system, in my opinion, is to inform decisions. You're gathering knowledge and gathering information so that you can determine next steps. And you can communicate this, which of course comes into like how we're sharing data, how we're communicating it, how effective it is in getting a student help quickly. And, um, and then you also have to consider your own preferences, whether you wanna use digital, whether you wanna use paper, you could have the best system, but if it's just not working for you in your circumstance at school, um, it's just not gonna be right. So here's, that's the good news. There's no perfect system. You're not missing a big piece of the information, but we do know it can get much better. One thing that I talk about in this series, so I'm not going to be able to go through it too much in depth because this would be hours and hours of talking about it, is a very common data collection system that I see and I used myself, and that is anecdotal notes. So I'm actually very pro anecdotal notes. And in just a nutshell, those are when a special educator is taking observational notes, providing like a ton of information on what they're observing, what's happening. Maybe there's information on what's before, the antecedent, what's happening after. And the uh, idea is to give a big picture so that maybe you're presenting this to the IEP team and we can make a decision because it's like that holistic approach. That's awesome. And special educators taking a lot of time to put them together. However, I have noticed, and this is unfortunate, as a participant in IEP meetings from the teacher, from the coach um, role, and I mean, just sitting in hundreds and hundreds of meetings, 
Unfortunately, I have noticed that anecdotal notes sometimes don't carry as much weight in the conversation. And that's a shame because they should, right? That's super unfortunate. And hopefully it has not happened to you. But I have seen anecdotal notes that are coming from a place of like providing that big picture and more information. And they're they're slightly dismissed. And one area or one reason I think that happens is that I have seen that they have been perceived as like a little bit more of an opinion or a bias that um, I've heard like, well, this student, like maybe it's a behavior um, topic that we're discussing. And they're saying like that teacher, like, doesn't like the student because they're disrupting or um, I've heard like you don't like my child or something like that like this is one-sided and that you, you know it's not true but I have seen this happen I've seen this happen often so what I'm doing in this better data collection system is I am showing some effectiveness and I'm going to talk about a little bit more as we go today how to make them more effective but I refer to it as data that speaks and that is not my I didn't coin that phrase but I heard it and I latched onto it because I just think that is exactly what we want. We don't want to just pick a data collection system because it's um, really attractive, like all the color coding and it looks so nice, which we all love, but we want it to actually like communicate and communicate it quickly and effectively, data that speaks. And that is where I think anecdotal notes could get a little mini makeover um, so that we can make sure it's communicating what we want it to. So Anecdotal notes, observational notes, we know they're really popular. We know they um, can provide a lot of information, but we might want to tweak them just a little bit. One area to do that in that I go more in depth in in the email series and in the training is numbers. Numbers seem to speak louder and it's really whether it's fair or it's not fair. But let's just think of it like outside of our zone of genius of special education, but think of it like in your personal life. If you're getting a fence built and it's April and somebody says, oh, well, I'm going to be able to put that fence up in um, late spring, but we're actually really backed up. So it might be early summer and like you can put your deposit down and you're trying to make that decision based on that information on whether you should put a deposit down or whether you should keep shopping, you know, for another fence company. Maybe you have a dog <laughs> that's entering, like being, um, invited into your family and they're coming in May. And so you're just really not sure what to do. Okay. Well, that's a decision based on the data that you have received from the fencing company. But what if the fencing company took out a calendar and said, in 53 days, we will be able to put that fence up with 100% certainty. That's really helpful data. Then you can make a clear yes or no. You can look at your calendar and say, well, 53 days, my dog is coming on day like 62. That is going to be perfect or, you know, whatever it is, or 53 days is way too long. Um, but that is data speaks really loud. Numbers kind of cut through. The numbers aren't as, I mean, I, I hate to say the word biased, but like they don't have bias. You cannot dispute numbers like you can with words, which is unfortunate because we know that these anecdotal notes I referred to earlier are also effective, but we're talking about the communication part. I'm also asked about other types of data that you collect and present. And I have found that work samples can really cut through, just like numbers do. Work samples can be very effective, and they're very effective when you're speaking with families. And I've seen it in kind of two different ways. I've seen it where I, um, the gen ed teacher and I have presented work samples of a student. The student was doing really well, and we were collecting a variety of work samples and including work samples from this enrichment class the student participated in and where um, he or she were communicating in Spanish in written form. And when we presented that as a work sample and we were kind of disputing that this child like could not hold a pencil or write or you know do whatever it was we were talking about, we had evidence. So that was amazing to be able to present that. And a family member was shocked. Like this child was not showing <laughs> what he or she could do at home. This family like did not have that information, but we did. So we were able to provide that evidence. That was a good meeting. Like that turned out great. But it also can be used, of course, in other other situations with if you're documenting work samples with or without accommodations, without help, you can really get an idea of where a student is at. 
And that way is not necessarily represented by the numbers or by the anecdotal notes. Work samples can be awesome, awesome and speak very loud. All right, so now we're going into the digital versus paper. And that is a debate. I go both directions. I see that so many um, digital and paper options have been really helpful. They're not the perfect data collection system though. Let me show you what I mean. One of the principles that I really, really liked, and most of these are all made from like a real world situation that um, I shouldn't say most, all of these are made out of some kind of situation I was trying to improve. Like what I was doing was not working and I was looking for a solution. The student data tracking sheets was a big solution for some of my students. I found I was collecting so much data in a very traditional paper tracker, and um, and I was collecting like hundreds of data points based on my students, like the caseload and the objectives we were tracking data on. And I found when I made a more student-friendly approach, so they were doing a performance task, but they were doing it right onto the paper, I was getting huge benefits. One was the data was kind of tracking itself. For example, if a student was using a crayon and like coloring the words, you know, as they were demonstrating mastery, then I could just be looking at a quick glance at that page and grab that data point. But the other benefit was my student was getting immediate feedback and that was highly motivating for the students I was working with. Of course, you know your students best. You might say that would be the opposite. <laughs> that would have the opposite effect of a student I was working with. You know best, totally trust your instinct. But I found that student data tracking sheets in the form of a traditional printable, and printable is a teacher word. I'm not sure if it's a real world, a real word, but I did find that student tra data tracking sheets were an awesome way to quickly get data, collecting data. Another one is Google Forms. These are really popular. Now, I will admit, I did not use these Google Forms to collect data. Instead, I used it to organize data. So when I'm collecting data, it was usually like on the go. I work with really young students. So this is we're talking chicken scratch and a sticky note. But I would transfer that information into Google Forms. And I found that to be very useful because Google Forms are a great way to you can share them very easily with team members, they would collaborate, and we can analyze the data in a very organized fashion. So I found Google Forms to be awesome, but they weren't necessarily what I was using during the collection stage. But I did use Google Forms in um, the form format of a quiz. Let me scroll down and show you what I mean. So this is a series of quizzes. So students are actually taking the quiz and it's collecting data at the same time. So Pretty magical. And these are student friendly for younger students. I know there's lots of options for all different age groups and grades, but students are taking this quiz. It is individual, although you could assign it out to a class, but these are very student friendly with pictures and like on grade level or, or what they need. And students are answering the questions and it's automatically being collected. So Google quizzes are a awesome format. So these are also Google Forms, but they're done in a quiz format. So I highly, highly recommend including that in your data collection system. I have tons of hands-on tasks that come with observation sheets that you can just collect the data as the performance task is happening. I have tons of those that's very effective. Um, I do have a digital data collection system that uses boom cards. I don't know if you're familiar with boom cards, but those are also really, really fast, um, a fast way to collect accurate data. I think it's accurate, um, sometimes even more accurate because students like think they're playing a game. It's very interactive. They're playing a game. They're usually like very engaged. And so I feel like that data is going to be a little more accurate than if like you were having like a cold read of um, just like flashcards or something like that. I do use the paid subscription of Boom. There's two subscriptions, free and paid. The free, you can play any of these games. So what you'd be doing is you'd be having your students like log in and play the game, or you could be displaying it to a small group and then you can collect the data by their answers. You can do that. The paid version, what's the big difference about that one to me is that Boom has a system for collecting data. So you could just log in and see what your students had done and what would they, you know, how much their accuracy was and so on. And that to me is 
awesome. <laughs> that data is being collected itself and it's really useful the way Boom has it set up. So hopefully your school has a subscription to Boom. Um, I know that's probably not always going to be the case, but I found that to be really, really awesome. I do have a system. I'm right here, this digital data collection system. You could try this out with PowerPoints. These are in Boom form, but this is where students are not interacting like in a game format, but instead it's a series of flashcards and you are clicking like correct or incorrect. So again, with Boom, it's collecting that data for me. I can see it at the end, but these are more of a flashcard. If you don't have Boom, you can get these in a PowerPoint and display them and you're just doing a quick checklist. Yes, no, yes, no, whether they're answering it correct or not. So that's another option that's um, incorporating digital. And then I have a bundle of just traditional um, tons, it's a huge bundle of tons of resources with those traditional data collection like in the printable form. So there are many, many options. Some of them are gonna be just right for one student and some are gonna be just right for another. So digital pass cards. And so if you have the Boom subscription, those are collecting data themselves. And then I am going to write that word printables, although we're not sure if that is a real word. All right. So now let's just review what we have gone over. We're talking about how there's no system, so we can stop looking for one. And that's going to save us time, take off some of the pressure. Be sure to subscribe to the free email series so you can get your own downloads. Plus, um, I'm going through some anecdotal notes. This is giving you exemplars, examples of really effective anecdotal notes and non-examples that so you can compare and contrast talking about numbers. You're going to see that come up in the email series numbers because we're looking for data that really speaks. Um, I'm adding in work samples on how I used them. I know that can look different at different grade levels, but I find that that evidence, what you're doing in, with the idea of work samples is you're kind of removing yourself, right? This is a student's work. This is student evidence. This is not something that you had any kind of like opinion over at all. This is just like, can they do this or not do this? What are they doing independently? How is this looking, for example? And then we talked about all the different options. And my um, intention was just to show you like where I had success, how I used certain formats um, and which ones, which ones worked best in which situation. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link up this blog post. And in this blog post, you can read more. I've got some more information and a chance to sign up so you can get the free data forms and the free IEP masterclass training is also in there. I also have a link to a blog post that I speak about this very topic. And so you're going to hear, and I have, we talked about anecdotal. I have my own anecdotals in that podcast where I'm sharing just kind of my ups and downs and why I'm so passionate about data collection. Hopefully you are too. All right, thanks so much for watching. Um, I'll be sure to link below and don't forget to hit subscribe so that you can um, catch the next video and not miss a thing. Thank you.